My first guest is currently riding the wave of success is C.J. Parker on Baywatch. She's also Playboy's favorite cover girl. Please welcome the very beautiful Pamela Anderson. The 90s were a wild ride. From Playboy cover girl to Baywatch babe to that stolen tape of Pam and then husband rocker Tommy Lee. A tape was stolen from Tommy Lee and myself. IEG is now selling that tape worldwide illegally without my or Tommy's consent. Further, we have not received one penny or signed an agreement permitting them to merchandise this tape. Pamela Anderson was born July 1st, 1967, in Ladysmith, Canada, to parents Barry and Carol Anderson. Her father was 19 and her mother 17 years old when they welcomed Pamela into the world. Barry and Carol had quite a toxic relationship and often found themselves in trouble. In her book, Pamela writes, My parents were hot trouble, the local Bonnie and Clyde. They were both ridiculously jealous and they seemed to enjoy fighting as much as making up. My dad would sneak my underage mom into the local bar, and when the cops came, off they went running, my mom hiding in the bathroom, her bright yellow jumper giving her away. Once, when dad was trying to outrun the police, he totaled his green Ford Fairlane. Mom was in the passenger seat begging for him to slow down. Her pretty head went through the windshield. She was pregnant with me at the time, and we joked that that might explain things. Well, I mean, I had a, I had a very adventurous kind of um, wonderful upbringing. I mean, my upbringing was in nature and at the beach. I mean, I was really, really fortunate, really fortunate. My parents were madly in love, very young. Um, and, you know, this, they're still together. They're more in love than ever. And they're my heroes. But, you know, we have, um, we all have, you know, nothing is perfect. No human is perfect. And we all got through it. Growing up in a tiny cabin on property that her grandparents owned, Pamela was a very inquisitive girl, spending most of her time chasing fairies, throwing rocks, and climbing trees with her younger brother. She writes, I always felt safer outdoors than in. We slid around in puddles, picking wildflowers, berries, and making mud pies. To Pamela, the outdoors would be her safe place, because at home, she was subjected to domestic violence. On several occasions, Pamela witnessed her father beat her mother. She writes, Dad sent Mom's new vacuum flying over her head. She had been trying to tidy the living room, but the hockey game was on, and Dad felt she was making too much noise. I remember my mom crying a lot, always quietly in the bathroom. Why do you think, Pamela, you were, tend to be, and have been victimized? Victimized? Yeah, sure you um, well, you know, I grew up in a very, uh, in an alcoholic home and, and there was violence in my, in my household. And I think it's just my model of a relationship. And when I got into any kind of relationships, it just seems to, you recreate the pattern, even though you say you're never, ever going to do that. You're never going to have the same relationship. My poor mom is, she's still with my father. My father is a great grandfather. He's a, a wonderful grandfather, but he's a terrible husband. And, <laughs> and my mom still suffers because she's, it's verbal abuse used to be physical abuse, and it just, and she just, you know. As a child, Pamela tried to intervene during her parents' altercations, but her involvement would only make matters worse. She would instigate conflict between herself and her father so that his anger would go from her mother to her. Pamela was also becoming very rebellious and disobedient. On one occasion, her father would teach her a lesson. She writes, My cat, Momsy, had just given birth to another set of kittens outside on our deck. I decided to bring them in, which I'd been told point blank not to do. Dad walked back in to see me holding the box of kittens. I was horrified, caught red-handed. She was failed by so many who kids count on to feel safe. Her father. I was told not to bring the kittens into the house. And I had my kittens in the house. And so he ended up putting them in a paper bag and running down to the beach with me, screaming after him. And he drowned the kittens. How old were you? Of... Uh, Probably six or seven. In dealing with her parents' volatile marriage, Pamela found comfort and peace with animals. When her father drowned those kittens, it would shape and influence her relationship with people and animals in the future. Though very traumatic, her trauma wouldn't end there. Over the course of Pamela's life, she would be a victim of regular abuse at the hands of multiple people. In her book, she begins with her first abuser, writing, At a young age, I learned that people are mostly awful. Babysitters are even worse. That's what happens when you are messed with as a child. 
In my case, it was a young female babysitter who sexualized me very early, forcing me to play weird games on her body like car. My parents thought she was generous and kind when really it was just a way to get them off her scent. She threatened me and told me not to tell anyone or else. I couldn't tell my parents that she was touching me and making me touch her in ways I don't want to remember. I just forgot about it, pushed it away, and hoped no one would ever find out. I carried that my entire young life. Uh, a babysitter, um, uh, you know, she molested me when I was, you know, probably about six years old, and I wished her dead, and then she died, and it's just a bunch of um, crazy things that have happened. <laughs> I just got through it, I think, with my imagination. I still feel like... Um, you know, I don't, I don't feel like a victim. I don't feel, I feel like there's all, there's things that happen in people's lives and you have to get over them because <laughs> they accumulate. You know, one th something happens to you, then another thing happens and it kind of compounds. Yeah. So it's great to be able to go back and feel those feelings and get through those and not hold, uh, just forgiveness is a big thing. Pamela kept what her babysitter did to her a secret. She suppressed it buried it, and locked it away. At school, Pamela excelled. She was smart, witty, and athletic. Though she didn't have many friends, she had a way of standing out. In her book, Pamela writes that she was, quote, an agent provocateur, saying that she'd sometimes act out in class, but that she liked the attention because it was on her own terms. But one thing Pamela didn't like was the fact that she wasn't quite developing as fast as some of the other girls her age, because Pamela was a late bloomer, this made her feel really insecure. Obviously, you, you're growing up, and at what age do you start to develop breasts? I didn't. I was very. I was a gymnast my whole life, so I didn't oh, even no get wonder. my period until I was 18. Oh, that's so sexy! I didn't, oh, I didn't Howard, develop until I was 18. Oh, you. oh, a girl. Oh, she's this beautiful and no period. Oh, is that <laughs> oh, cute? I was 18. Oh, you are so, so cute. Wack. See, that's why you got a great body. You were a gymnast. A gymnast, yeah. Could you do like a headstand and stuff? So, what age do you lose your virginity? And you, hadn't, and you hadn't even had your period yet right. at 16. Right. Oh, that's the best. Oh, you. Yeah. That's the best. That's so feminine. <laughs> Pamela wasn't very feminine. She was more of a tomboy. Wanting to fit in, she befriended a girl who encouraged her to doll herself up a bit. One night, after doing their hair and makeup, they went to an unknown house. In her book, Pamela details the following, quote, One girlfriend would always ask me if she could put makeup on me and do my hair. The goal was to look older, and I soon found out why. She had a friend, an older guy, and we were going to his place. He was maybe 20. I was much too young to be there. We were only 12, 13. At the guy's townhouse, my friend went upstairs with him while his roommate said he wanted to teach me to play backgammon. I naively said okay. Then he wanted to give me a back rub. Then he forced himself on me. I did not have an easy childhood. Um, despite loving parents, I was molested from age 6 to 10 by my female babysitter. I went to a friend's boyfriend's house, and while she was busy, the boyfriend's older brother decided he would teach me backgammon, which led into a back massage, which led into rape, my first heterosexual experience. He was 25 years old, and I was 12. After this traumatic experience, Pamela became very distant as she dealt with severe shame, humiliation, and guilt. She writes, I was forced against my will. I thought I was bad and I was ashamed. It hurt me a lot. Keeping this secret, it was so confusing and I didn't know who to go to. I knew I shouldn't have been there and I didn't want to get anyone in trouble. I started to trust people around me even less. Eventually, I just blocked it out. To avoid reliving this nightmare, Pamela stayed busy by becoming an overachiever at school. She played volleyball, tennis, sang in the choir, was neat, tidy, and an overall perfectionist. Things seemed to be moving forward for the teen, but then she would meet Jack. Quote, I had one serious boyfriend through high school. His nickname was Boogeyman Jack. We were always making out, kissing, or fighting. He was handsome, a bad boy, a hot rod enthusiast with a hot temper. One angry night, he started kicking me over and over until he physically kicked me out of his car while he was driving. As I matured, I noticed most of my boyfriends were bad and progressively got worse. I often wondered why. Did I turn them into jerks? Was I doing something wrong? Did I make them crazy? They would turn violent, 
mean, cruel, so quickly. I felt I did everything to try to get them to love me by being accommodating or generous, but none of it worked. My first boyfriend kicked me out of moving cars. It was very violent. You know, tried to run me over all the time. With his, with his You're so beautiful. You think men would like yeah. be so happy to be, be with me? Yeah, I, what do you I think, think? I'm, a, I'm a button pusher. I think I provoke people <laughs> into craziness because it seems that even in my relationships, I drive people completely mm-hmm. insane. But I, I, I don't think know. men want to own you like they feel like they want to take ownership of you and they forget you're a human being and you might not want to go along with the program no and and i go along for a while and then when i don't want to do it anymore i really don't want to do it anymore i'm serious i don't want to do this anymore it's not a game right bye (laughs) But, but men go hey wait a second honey you can't leave me pamela's relationship with jack wouldn't end after he pushed her out of a moving vehicle they would be off and on for years with the relationship getting no better She writes, he was jealous, and he would get mean. If he heard me singing, he'd say I was tone deaf. If we were dancing, he'd say I had no rhythm. Those little things were meant to try to erode my confidence. And to an extent, they did. But then one day, I met a new boy, Billy. Always, always in trouble. I know my mother's like, you know, it's all going to come back. Would you get the attention from the male species back then that you get now? Were you... Were you popular with the boys? Uh, I always had a boyfriend. I always had I always had a boyfriend, I guess, but it's, I have no memory of any other man before my husband, so... I think I had boyfriends. It's, it's, it's just hazy. I don't know. It's kind of foggy back then. All kind of a blur. It's all a blur. Billy wasn't any better than Jack. He was violent, sold drugs, and in a gang. One night, after running an errand with Billy and his friends, Pamela details the following... Quote, he was hiding me in the back seat of his car under a blanket while he and his friends went to collect money from someone. They were successful and came back all fired up. They held me down, pulled my shirt up and put hickeys all over me. And it got worse. There were at least four, maybe six boys. I blacked out. So women and men subjected you to abuse, right? Right. Yep, yeah. Right, yep. Yeah. Throughout my childhood. Yeah. And, and then there was a, a guy in high school who they, they, like a boyfriend who gang. You, he invited his, his friends. Friend. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is fucking crazy. I know. I wrote it all out the other day because I'm writing my new book, The Sensual Vegan, which isn't just about food, about being compassionate and compassion is sexy and all that kind of stuff. Right. And uh, I start off the first chapter with kind of just going right. through the motions and it's really, I try not to go too deep into it, but then I was like, wow, you know, I survived a lot. Yeah. And, but everybody survives a lot. Everyone has gone through stuff and, you know, and then you could quit to judge people, but they probably had some kind of craziness go on right. in life. You don't I mean, know. people willing to where they are. You, yeah. you were a 14 or 15 year old girl living in Canada and uh, you're gang raped, yeah. literally gang raped. Mm-hmm. Most people don't come back from that. They really don't. They, and it, that was after the molestation when I was young. Right. You know, and then that, you know, and then I had an older man try and teach me backgammon and, and mate right after that. By the time Pamela graduated high school, she had been through so much trauma, pain and abuse that she just wanted to move away and start over somewhere new with a clean slate. She didn't have plans to go to college, but instead decided to move off the island into the mainland. And that's where Pamela would say fate stepped in. You couldn't possibly have imagined that you would be discovered just by going to a football game or something. Do you remember what happened? You go to this football game, it's the BC Lions went, or something? Yeah, it was the BC Lions, and I got free tickets from my next-door neighbor, and they're like, come on, Pamela, let's go to the game. And, and we were all wearing Labatt's Blue Zone t-shirts because this guy was a representative for Labatt's, and so he had all the free t-shirts. We had free clothes, free tickets, free... I said, okay, this has got to be fun. This will be all right. And we were just sitting in the stands, and one of the cameramen zoomed in on me and put me up on the big screen and everyone was yelling. It was really bizarre. I looked up and I just remember going, I look old. And I looked back and I went, oh my God, wait a second. My first reaction was that I looked old. (laughs) And then I realized I was up there and then I was down in the 50-yard line doing some drawing. After Pamela was spotted at the football game, she began receiving lots of phone calls from people wanting to work with her. Producers, writers, directors, you name it. Eventually, she was offered a commercial and a poster and became known as the Blue Zone Girl. Though this was great news for Pamela, it was upsetting for her then fiance, Mike. Once again, Pamela was in a very unhealthy relationship. She writes, Mike became jealous, worried about where I was at all times. One day, Pamela got a call from Marilyn Grabowski, who worked for Playboy and who had found Pamela's number in the phone book. 
She had her eye on Pamela for quite some time and wanted her to fly out to L.A. for the October 89 cover. Now with this opportunity at hand, Pamela had a big decision to make. Realizing her tumultuous relationship with Mike was going nowhere, Pamela took the risk and accepted Playboy's offer. She packed her things and flew to L.A. to meet the man who would put her on the map, Hugh Hefner. My fiancé at the time, I was engaged at the time, and he said, if you go do Playboy, then that's it. That's oh, it. I like that I know. Of so out of spite, I did it. Oh, really? And that yes. was it? And that was it. <laughs> and I moved to L.A. Course, the guy said, Playboy or me. Right. Well, but he's sorry now, huh? Well, there's other reasons, too, why it didn't work yeah. out. But When Pamela arrived in L.A., it was a culture shock compared to the small town she was from. Excited for this new adventure, Pamela took it all in. She writes, Playboy had put me up at the Bell Age Hotel in Beverly Hills. Marilyn called to invite me to a private party the next night at the Playboy Mansion. It was just a small private party to watch Mike Tyson fight on the big screen. The next evening, a stretch limo waited at the curb to take me to the mansion. You know, my first day at the Playboy Mansion, I was in my acid wash jeans, you know, and some rock t-shirt with my sneakers on with the little balls on the socks, you know, and they were like, you know, you can come to the Playboy Mansion closet and get dressed for the next time you come out. And I thought, well, what kind of clothes would be in the Playboy Mansion closet? <laughs> right. He didn't even right? know. What innocent well, it little like, Pamela. People wear clothes. It's almost like the Twilight Zone. They want to mold you into the same person in a way. David LaChapelle used to say going to the Playboy Mansion was like the Twilight Zone. Like he thought he saw a hundred of me from the back and then they would turn around and not be me. <laughs> right. <laughs> it be, but it's true. Yeah. And then they move you in, right? I mean, like you get to get a room there and you live there and they feed I you and the whole stay thing. There. I wouldn't Why? stay there. I was nervous. I don't know. I mean, this is my spidey sense, my Mr. Magoo thing. I just always thought, even when I came here, the first thing they said was, well, you'll stay at the Playboy Mansion. I said, no, I'll stay at a hotel. Then I stayed at the hotel and they would call me and say, Pamela, we want you to come for a fight night. And I'd say, I'm not fighting anybody. They're like, oh no, we're just coming to watch like Mike Tyson fight on the big screen. But I thought they might need a jello wrestle or something. And they said, no, you don't have to mud wrestle. You're fine. I said, okay, good. Cause I'm not. At the Playboy Mansion, Pamela met several celebrities, from Jack Nicholson to Smokey Robinson, all kinds of different personalities. But then she would meet the man who everyone was there to see, Hugh Hefner. She writes, I looked up to see Mr. Hefner as he came down the stairs, smiling in his dark blue smoky jacket. Time felt slowed down as people greeted him. He was right in my line of view, maybe on purpose. He looked toward me, and we smiled at each other. I took a deep breath as he passed through his friends and brushed past gorgeous girls politely. But his energy and charm felt directed toward me. I had to look away. It made my skin burn. Well, hello, Pamela. I heard you had an eventful journey, he said, his pipe teetering in his mouth. I love the smell of smoke. It comforted me. With liquid eyes, he looked around at the other men in the room and said softly, Marilyn is going to take very good care of you. Don't worry, darling. You're safe here. Then he broke into a character, it seemed, and laughed his famous laugh and said, Oh boy, we're going to have to keep an eye on you. This felt like the epitome of chivalry. A true gentleman. Elegant. Passionate. So charming. And yet, with that little boy giggle. It's hard to explain his laugh, but if you heard it once, you'd never forget it. <laughs> now, you moved to L.A. What was it like moving here? You came from a small town Very in small town. Canada? Can you're Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. What part of Canada? A Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island. Yeah. Love it. It's a small town. What was it like when you got here? Was it... Oh, I didn't know what to expect. I thought I was going to come here. You know, everyone's going to have these big shoulder pads with parrots on their shoulder. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought everyone was going to be crazy, but I was totally prepared for anything. But everyone was so nice. I mean, when I went to Playboy, everyone there was really down to earth and really sweet. And, and I did the cover, and then I, then I became a playmate, and I said I would stay here until I stopped working. And I'm still here, so... Still working. So you came to L.A. to do the the cover of Playboy? You, right. That was the you reason. You hold the record, don't you? Yeah, for, for covers. covers. For what? Yeah. For, for what? Covers. Yeah. Oh, for covers. Oh, oh, okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Pamela's arrival in Hollywood would take off upon appearing on the cover of Playboy in 1989. Though she had once suffered from severe self-esteem issues, Pamela states that appearing nude in Playboy made her feel empowered and in control over her own body. To her, it wasn't exploitation. It was liberating. When you pose for Playboy, you can tell from the documentary and from the book that something changes in you. When? <laughs> Which the first, time? The first time. 
When I did Playboy? Yeah. Well, I was extremely shy, if anyone can believe that. I was painfully shy. I actually felt paralyzed by it. And I was doing this as a leap of faith. It was really a leap of faith. And I, and I think that that's where I kind of took my power back. I felt empowered by it. I felt like a woman. I felt like I had claimed my sensuality, my sexuality, that this was my body and I was in control. That people had, if my understanding of that is that people had tried to take that from you or tried to own you, own your body, own your sexuality, and then that's what you mean by take it back? Well, this this with the, the times where I felt used, you know, okay. I was, um, you know, taken advantage of when I was a young teenager and again with a boyfriend and his friends and I felt really shut down and that was, I think, what the shyness was. I felt really confused. I just really felt empowered for once. I still wanted to be a sensual, sexy woman, but I had no idea how to be that without causing, without people thinking of me differently. You know, I really felt when, when I was and when they were, and at 12 years old, when uh, an older man uh, me, I felt like it was imprinted on my forehead. I, as much as I didn't want to tell anybody, I felt like everybody knew. And I felt I was so ashamed. And and then I, you know, it was just, conf- it was just a very confusing time for me. And really everything came together when I made the choice yeah. to be in Playboy. And I felt, you know, at the Playboy Mansion and just how things kind of, yeah. I felt I felt safe there. Yeah. I mean, people think that's crazy, but actually I, I knew when I was there that people were looking out for me and, yeah. and, yeah, that's when the, a lot changed then. As Pamela's popularity in Hollywood grew, she would catch the eyes of a few guys. She was the young new girl in town, and everyone wanted to get to know her. John Peters, a major movie mogul and studio head, would relentlessly pursue Pamela. She writes, I told John that Playboy wanted me to be a centerfold. He protested, saying, I'll pay you double not to do it. I refused his offers at first. He talked me into moving to his Bel Air home. Then the gifts started pouring in, and I couldn't help but accept. It started to feel rude not to. The doorbell would ring, and a chauffeur would bring me a little red box from Cartier, Ralph Lauren. I was measured and had things tailored. He'd call me over, patting his lap for me to sit on it, and then present a diamond tennis bracelet. It was becoming more and more like that. Then he said I could use his cream-colored Bentley with his driver at my disposal and, of course, have my own Mercedes. John lived in a separate home, not far away. John would pop by unannounced, and we'd go for drives in his Range Rover. Pamela was young, naive, and living her best life in L.A. She was being wined and dined by this very powerful man, who she believed had pure intentions. It would take for Pamela to go on a date with Mario Van Peebles to see that there was more to the story. She writes, Mario asked what I was doing there, and I said, I live here. He asked, why? With whom? I told him that someone had given me the house. He had more questions. I said, this happens to everyone. He said, no, this does not happen to everyone. He said, I think you need to get your things and get out of here. Take only what you brought. There's more to this story. And I'm afraid you won't be able to get out of this if you wait too long. Mario's words shocked me. But the more I thought about it, the more I started to realize that maybe I had been conveniently blind. It was common knowledge that these rich and powerful men ate new girls up, promised them the world, and spat them out when it was time to move on to the next starlet. I'm glad it never came to that. Uh, Hollywood is very seductive and people want to be famous and, and sometimes you think you're going to be safe and with, with an adult in the room or, you know, I don't know where this um, security comes from, but somehow I've dodged, I dodged it all. I've been offered lots of things, a condo and a Porsche to be someone's number one girl. And I just naively said, well, there must be number two then, so I'm not interested. <laughs> or just, just, you know, money, homes, roles in movies. And I just didn't want to do it that way. I had no desire. Upon moving out of John's house, Pamela rented a small apartment and continued focusing on her career. At the time, Pamela had a role on the TV sitcom Home Improvement, where she played Lisa the Tool Time Girl. On her first day of filming, Pamela alleges that one of the actors exposed himself to her. She writes, I walked out of my dressing room and Tim Allen was in the hallway with his robe. He opened his robe and flashed me quickly. 
completely naked underneath. He said it was only fair, because he had seen me naked. It must be noted that Tim Allen has denied these allegations with a public statement saying, quote, No, it never happened. I would never do such a thing. Tim Allen denying any allegations that you've he flashed you on the set of Home Improvement. What do you make of his response? Well, he can, he was, it was funny. It was the first day of filming, and I was in my dressing room, and I came out, and then he came out of his dressing room, and he had this robe on, and he goes, and, I, and, he, and he closed it, and he goes, now we're even. I've seen you naked. You've seen me naked. Now we can start the show. Yeah. So um, how could you make that up? Right. I mean, then he ran, specific. Then he ran back into his room, and then he was embarrassed all day and acting like a little giddy schoolboy. I was like, okay. Yeah, you can't make that stuff up. But, you know, he has to deny it because look at the times we're in. What if he said, oh, yeah, I did that? He'd be, I mean, I, it's just, you know, a lot of these stories are just the tip of the iceberg. Not that story, but, I mean, saying I just, I wanted, and I only talked about really pivotal moments to try to get across that some of these things had happened, you know, in my, well, my, my childhood, my career. While Pamela was working on Home Improvement, Playboy, who at the time served as her agent, received several offers from producers, screenwriters, and such to work with the up-and-coming model. One of those gigs would be her most iconic role yet, Baywatch. One last role proved difficult to fill. No one was clicking for the new character of C.J. Parker. Orenstein and Glicksman then auditioned the girlfriend of actor David Charvet. Susie and I knew this was the girl. We, at least we did by the end of the... And uh, she canceled on us 11 times, okay? By the 11th, and we kept going into these auditions with these guys saying, guys, there's a girl you gotta see. The girl was 25-year-old Pamela Denise Anderson. She missed an appointment, and I said, listen, Susie Fern, we don't need that. She's, you know, blonde. How many blondes do we have in the waiting room? And they said, no, 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 this girl is special. And Doug and Michael were kind of, eh about it and and they said you can't let this girl walk out of the room she was very bubbly and sweet and adorable and uh, honestly she was the girl it was it was just you knew it david hasselhoff however expressed serious misgivings i had reservations always and i'll go on record and i have been on record as saying anybody who was in playboy i just bothered me i uh, we didn't need that David was always the voice of, my kids have to watch this show, you know, and we were always the voice of, true, but men have to watch this show as well, and women, you know, adults have to watch this show, and sex sells. When Baywatch premiered, it took off and became a hit, further pushing Pamela into the spotlight. By her fourth season, she was the highest paid actress on the show. Billions of people tuned in to watch Baywatch, and before you knew it, it was the number one show in the world. Pamela was dubbed Hollywood's blonde bombshell, but with the fame comes a cost. Pamela would come to learn fairly quickly how little the public and the industry thought of her. She was seen as just a sex symbol, and was often objectified and sexualized by her peers. Welcome to the show. And you look like you're happy to see them. You know, we, uh, we're on at 135. You could have felt comfortable to dress more provocatively if you wanted to. That's a wonderful outfit there. The attention Pamela was getting was a lot to take in. She was young, beautiful, and attracted lots of men wanting to date her. She would entertain a few of them, though the relationships wouldn't amount to much. But on New Year's Eve, 1995... Pamela would meet the man she would go on to marry and have a tumultuous relationship with, Motley Crue drummer Tommy Lee. She writes, It was that New Year's Eve at a bar I co-owned with some friends called The Sanctuary that I met Tommy. I sent a shot to everyone in the VIP room. I think Tommy thought I sent it to only him. He came bounding over to my table, wallet chain swinging, no shirt on, 
just tattoos and nipple rings. He sat beside me and licked the side of my face. Tommy had quite the past and resembled the type of man that Pamela always seemed to attract, the bad boy. Her friends warned her to stay away from him, that he was no good. But after months of being dodged by Pamela, Tommy finally got her number and called her up. She writes, There was no easy way for him to track me down. He was determined. It was impressive. The two would reconnect a few days later in Mexico after one of Pamela's photo shoots, and from there, the rest is history. She writes, I still don't know how he got my number, but I checked my voicemail and it was full of messages from Tommy. At the time, I was in love with Kelly Slater, we were dating, but he was on and off with his ex-girlfriend and I was starting to get that feeling of wanting to get married and have babies. Our first night together in Mexico, we went to a club called La Boom. Tommy must have slipped something special in my champagne. The room got warm and fuzzy and my skin felt like butter. He said, let's get married. And I said, okay. On February 19th, 1995, after only 96 hours of being together on vacation, Tommy and Pamela wed. The two, as they put it, were madly, crazily, and obsessively in love. But the honeymoon wouldn't last long. Shortly after they were married, Pam and Tommy had some problems. She writes, My new husband was with me on set every minute, because I was his, he'd say. One day, Tommy punched the producer in the face after he'd been told to go home. Between filming my movie, Barb Wire, and Baywatch, I was working constantly. It felt like I needed to be on 24-7, and yet I could barely stay awake. Then a girlfriend introduced me to something that would keep me going a bit longer. These were speedy diet pills she got from her boyfriend. Everyone started to get concerned, and rightly so. I started to keep to myself on and off the set. I was worried about upsetting Tommy. He got so angry and jealous when I had scenes with other men, especially if I was kissing someone else. I had been at the end of my rope. I was confused, sad, tired, not in my right mind. I had gotten into a bathtub and tried to swallow a bottle of Advil with vodka. Pamela would soon be found by her driver and taken to the hospital. Tommy's behavior was out of control and too much for Pamela to handle. Tommy, how you feel I'm about that? Making a political statement. Yeah. You love it, right? Whatever she wants. You to were do, so man. proud of her, right? Oh. I mean, you loved it. He's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, of course. Why would Tommy not love it? <laughs> Tommy loved it. <laughs> no, so, he's really jealous. Remember, baby, you're really jealous. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. Like anything. I, I'd be no jealous. Machines, no kissing, nothing. Yeah, I'm that guy. You're you know, my manager. You know, before yeah. you met. <laughs> before, <laughs> that's what I heard. While in the hospital, Tommy and Pamela would come to find out that they were expecting. Unfortunately, that pregnancy would result in a miscarriage. A few months later, the couple found out they were expecting again. It's nice. It's Tommy's pregnant. You know, he looks <laughs> pregnant. He's glowing. Just a couple weeks ago, he just started really glowing. He has whole peacefulness about him. He talks softer. And I was looking at him like, wow, you really are pregnant. You're pregnant. <laughs> what does it do for your body? Does it make you feel differently? Does it make you feel more in touch with, you know, the Womanhood? mother within or something? Or? <laughs> <laughs> the mother within, yes. Um, I love it. I mean... I love it. I mean, right now this dress is a little uncomfortable and I'm a little packed, but <laughs> most of the time I love it. It's funny. Your body's like a little, you know, I'm like a cartoon character now. It's funny. Does it interfere with your married life or can you still have, you know, a normal I always marriage? laugh hysterically when we have sex now. <laughs> Tommy and Pamela welcomed their son Brandon Lee on June 5th, 1996. Paparazzi were eager to capture pictures of the newborn and would often camp outside their home hide out in trees, and climb fences. Because of this invasion of privacy, Tommy and Pamela stay locked away in their home, away from the public eye for a while. But on their first date night, away from their son, all hell would break loose when paparazzi snacked pictures of the couple coming out of the Viper room. Hey, Tommy! Tommy! Pamela writes, The paparazzi made our lives extremely difficult. They would antagonize us, especially Tommy. There were car crashes, sending people off the road into ditches, rocks thrown through windows. It was bad. That night, though, Tommy shoved the photographer hard, while another photographer farther away filmed us. It was a setup. They knew we most likely had a few drinks in us, and that it was going to be easy to get a rise out of Tommy. Asshole, you're a 
Yeah. You're a drug fiend. How dare you do that? Where's your child this time of the morning? Where's your baby? Where is your baby? Kill you. You fing asshole. Hey, get control! Get control! Get your hands off of me! Get the fing out of here, asshole! Tommy and Pamela would rack up several lawsuits against them for assault and battery for fighting with the paparazzi. In addition to these lawsuits, the couple would once again face issues in their marriage, with Pamela leaving Tommy when Brandon was just a baby. So I don't know what happened. The two of you had some kind of fight. Yeah, it was a bad breakup. It was a bad breakup. Just a lot of well, drinking. It wasn't, it wasn't really a fight, actually. It was just a drinking? Yeah, I was just drinking. Which means a rock star. You got to drink. Yeah, but not that much. Really? Well, he was like, holding what Brandon. Do? Like, what was a typical day? He would never, it was never that he was really mean to me. It's just, I saw him, he came home and he'd like want to hold Brandon and stumble around with Brandon. And the next day, you know, I was gone. I was like, yeah. I can't see. He's stumbling around with our son. Yeah, you worried about Mexicans. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Cool. Letter and I didn't, I didn't, we didn't really have a fight or anything. I just said, you know, it just doesn't doesn't mix. I'm just really, I just don't think this this is gonna work out. And, right. and I didn't cool. say, I didn't tell Tommy not to stop drinking. I told, didn't say anything. I just was really leaving. Right. You didn't want to be a drag. Back. I didn't want to tell him what to do with his life or anything. I just said that it's not working out. I don't feel comfortable. I'm, you know, my whole my mom sirens are going off. Yeah, but you know what? Yeah. It's hard for Tommy because you know it's hard. All of a sudden, you get married. and Everyone's telling you what to do. It used to be fun. You have a couple of cocktails and you know wake yeah. up and have. I never time. told him what to do. Were you we starting to feel like a drag? Were you feeling like a drag though? Like like oh man. And I, I don't want to be this guy's mother or anything. And exactly. I'm, so I'd uh, rather just leave. If he wants to do that, if he's still into all that stuff, then he can stay oh, doing man. that. And then, Poor well, Tommy, you can't even take a drink anymore. You can't even have one drink? <laughs> so, okay, so wait a second. So you, so you moved out. And you went mm -hmm. to live at that guy's, that hairdresser's house. What the hell's his name again? John Peters. John Peters. Is that a nice spread? That guy's a multimillionaire. He has a few nice places, yeah. Yeah, no wonder you didn't want to come home. Jeez. No. Christ, I like to go live there. And Tommy, would you start calling her every day? Uh, I didn't know where she was at. Oh, really? Man. Not for a while, no. That'd be yeah, weird. No. So how'd you end up getting together? I never even found out. Uh. When Pamela left Tommy, she went back to John Peters. John the studio head who whined and dined her when she first arrived in L.A. back in 1989. John would play a significant role in Pamela's life in the years to come. When Pamela and Tommy reconciled, they soon found out they were expecting. But not long after receiving such wonderful news, chaos would once again erupt. Pamela writes, A safe the size of a refrigerator was stolen out of our house, Tommy decided to get something from the safe, which was well hidden behind a carpeted wall in the garage. But when he pulled back the carpet, it was gone. The entire safe. It didn't take long to realize it had been stolen and could have been taken any time during a three to six month span. Not long after, we got a strange message from Bob Guccione of Penthouse. He warned that he had a video of us having intercourse. He offered five million cash for the rights to them. We were in shock and told him to F off. Tommy and Pamela's tape, which was made back in 1995 when they were in Mexico on their honeymoon, was allegedly stolen by a disgruntled construction worker who had been doing work at their home. Pamela and Tommy attempted to block the release of this tape to no avail. Hey, Chad, you're on the air. Hey, Howard, I was wondering, uh, is there any possible way to get a hold of that Pamela Anderson video? Not from us. Not from us. Some guy just sent it to me. I don't even know who. There was no return address. We don't know how. Uh, Gary knows the source, but nobody else does. Describe the cultural moment of the tape and what it sort of did. The tape is like the reason why several million people signed onto the internet. It was a reason to go on the internet because no one at that point thought, you know, the internet had as much potential for dominating communication and commerce and culture the way that it does now. But this sort of became a motivator for getting people to sign online because people wanted to get online. What do you think the legacy of the tape is for Pamela Anderson? It's hor it's actually horrible because if you think about today and the fappening and like how quickly the feminist blogosphere and Twitter blew up in horror and how, you know, women everywhere stood up and, you know, many men stood up and said, this is terrible that these photos were stolen. Though many found pleasure in the tape, this was a nightmare for Pamela and brought her back to a very dark period in her life. She once again felt humiliated violated and exploited. And if that wasn't enough, her marriage to Tommy was about to implode. She writes, we were so tired and overwhelmed. One night, both babies were settling down and Tommy was on the floor, rocking himself back and forth, holding his head and mumbling. 
It was a Tommy I'd never seen, didn't recognize. Tommy got physical with Pamela that night, throwing her and their newborn son into a wall. Why did he hit you, do you think? He was, he was jealous of the kids. He told me that, I know I'm third on the totem pole, and, and he actually, he threw me and Dylan into a wall, and Dylan had a huge welt on his head at seven weeks old. And, you know, what I, what I, I get nervous about is that everything is always sealed, and you can't talk about this, and you can't talk about that, but people can make up lies, and they can talk about everything they want when the truth is right in front of us. You're talking about it now? And I'm telling yeah. you now, and I just, it just, because I know. Is this for you? Yeah, because I, it's not like I'm trying to take him down at all. I want him to succeed more than anybody. I want him to his career to succeed. I want him, his, him to succeed as a father, and I want him to reach his true potential and full potential and just deal with his alcoholism, and I want him to get better, and I want him to be in our lives. When the cops arrived at their home, they arrested Tommy, as Pamela had visible injuries on her body. Since he was already on probation, Tommy was arrested immediately. He was sentenced to six months in jail. While in jail, he wrote to Pamela every day, begging for another chance. After being in jail for four months, Tommy was released. In an attempt to get Pamela back, Tommy did an interview to tell his side of the story. Here are some key moments from that interview. Um, and I just thought this would be a good opportunity for people to get to know me because of a lot of things that people don't know. What did we not know? Well, I obviously made a mistake. Um, and I'm changing some of the things in my life People are saying, you know, that I have beaten Pamela. That is not true. That's just not true. Um, I, grabbing uh, a woman and shaking a woman is not, not cool either. But that's what, that's what was done. Why, why would you do that? I mean, what was it about your anger that would make you lash out physically? not having, just not having the techniques to not, not let that happen. It's a lot of pressure. We've been going through a lot of stuff. So now sex tapes appearing, old boyfriend sex tapes appearing, new children, postpartum, my frustration. Two new, two new babies. Tommy comes third now instead of first. I'm a new father. I don't know how to deal with that. That's a first for me too. Just start stacking them all up. And you got a guy who really, the whole argument stemmed that evening from me wanting some love. What did you think sitting in jail that Dylan at six or seven weeks was in Pamela's arms? and that Brandon was watching mm -hmm. the altercation mm -hmm. that put you in jail. I mean, at six or seven weeks, accident, fate, could have left you with one son instead of two. Has that ever crossed your mind? Not during it. Not during it. Afterwards, absolutely. Not during it. That's not being very mindful, is it? Not being very aware. And it's, it's also not, it's also, I, you know, I've, I, can't, I take responsibility for me. It's, oh, it's also not mindful of the mother of the children swinging at me holding a seven-week-old child either. There's two unaware people here. It's not cool. So during all of this, uh, you, the two of you were going at each other as opposed to, to this being, being your action? Yes, ma'am. You, you don't hit girls. I never hit Pamela. I grabbed and shaked Pamela. I never hit her. I've never hit her in my life. I would never do that. That's insanity is what that is. I would never, ever do that. If you had the chance, that chance to apologize, would you apologize? Oh, I have. I have. Absolutely. I've had the opportunity many times. I apologize several times. <laughs> is there a side of you that thinks the two of you will get back together? I don't really know. I don't really know. 
It's hard to say. Do you want that? Do I want that? I've always wanted a family. Um, can't really do it by yourself. I mean, I guess I can. I will have to now. Um, but I don't really know. I don't. I'm. I'm only control in control of myself. I can't be responsible for Pamela. So, I'm not really sure where where she's at. There's. I get. I've gotten nothing but conflicting, contradictory, mixed messages from her. From I love you to the other side of the spectrum, you know. Though there was a restraining order in place, the two would secretly rendezvous and try to reconcile their relationship. After months of trying, though, there was no hope. Pamela was done. I think there's issues, obviously, I need to resolve in myself before I can, you know, move into a real healthy It's not time. that unusual either. It's not like, you know, why her? It's something like one in five women gets into an relationship. So actually, she represents a lot of women out there. And I think that's one thing that they like about her is that she's she's out there talking about an issue. That How many with. relationships have you been in? Would you say where you've been abused? Well, one, I mean, a couple. My okay. first relationship was very violent. Why don't you when, uh, this men don't understand? It, so we're going to ask it simply. <laughs> the first time you struck, why aren't you gone? Well, I think the first thing you lose in a, in a relationship is your self-worth. And I think it's really difficult to leave a relationship when you feel like nothing and you've, you've already been so belittled because it starts with verbal abuse, it starts with really demeaning somebody and by the time it gets to physical abuse, you really have no strength to leave you feel like you, this is the only person that's going to be with you because they keep telling you that you're ugly you're not you're stupid you're all these yeah, different but things you can't look in the mirror and believe that yeah you can of course you can it's you can. it's the only person you want to be admired by really is the person that you're in love with i mean you want admiration from other people but you know, it's so important and it's so destructive. How about you, knowing you're going to have physical pain? I mean, well, I mean, I eventually have gotten out of it. I have, I've, but I, it's I've not gotten easy. out of it. It's not easy. No, it's the hardest thing I ever had to do was go through what I went through. Upon the dissolution of her marriage, Pamela and her boys tried to move on with their lives. She went from being known as the Baywatch girl to being known as the woman who broke the internet with the first celebrity tape. As her life calmed down a bit, Pamela said that she wasn't looking for love, but then she met Kid Rock in 2001. It's important to note that in her book, Pamela refers to Kid Rock by his nickname, Bob. She writes, I met Kid Rock at a charity concert. When Kid Rock called Tommy to tell him that he loved me and wanted to marry me, Tommy told him to F off and that he would take his life. But Bob and I started dating anyway. We broke up a few times over the years, mostly due to Tommy's interference and meddling. The Kid Rock? Mm -hmm. It's good. I think, you know what I could say, right now we're in the trenches, right? We're just working on things. I mean, you, you, you care for each other oh, a lot? yes, we love each other very much, but it's, it's um, a difficult life. It's a difficult life, and I want what's best for my kids, Did and he has a son. your first experience, maybe, with Tommy Lee scare you off others? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm still scared to death. Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding? And, and I need to resolve a lot of issues with that. Bob is a wonderful, talented Man, and I, that's, it's exciting and it's wonderful to be with someone who's really talented and has their own life and, and a, a lot of times... Well, your first really... relationship turned so... Have you had other musicians thing. in your life too? Uh, have I? I don't know. I don't, know. You I don't, don't remember? remember? I don't remember. <laughs> Are there, is, there a, is there a downside, I don't know how to put this, to being well endowed? <laughs> no. Yeah, tell us about <laughs> being well endowed. I'd like to know too. Is there any downside to it? In other words, that... Do you feel that people look at you because you're well endowed, or that sometimes, you know, is that you're that this mind, this is? Bring it on. I don't mind. She knows how to use it to her advantage. I think she's she's too smart to be a victim because of it. She knows how to use it. Look what she it's gotten her a long way, right? Pamela and Kid Rock wed in Saint Tropez on July 29th, 2006, but their union would be short lived. She writes, "Bob found us a suitable home. We were about to move in until the premiere of Borat." I didn't tell Bob I was in the movie because I wanted to surprise him. I forgot about the part in the film that referenced the tape. Bob stormed out, calling me a whore and worse. Pamela and Kid Rock filed for divorce on November 27, 2006. I was putting people in my life to um, kind of numb some of the pain or be with someone, companionship, but nothing, nothing healthy. <laughs> Yeah, would you, like, like some of the marriages were quick. 
as you point out, you know, like, Kid, I don't know how long you were married to Kid Rock, but what is it like after you get, like, when do you know, oh my God, this was a tremendous f***ing mistake. Do you know right away or did you, did you did? Right when I got did married. You, <laughs> did you, you knew it was a mistake when the, when the ceremony was going on, in other words? Well, just after. Obviously, just after. Time. <laughs> how does that work, Pam? Explain That's it to terrible. me. That's like, terrible. I know. It's embarrassing. It's just a flaw. Is it embarrassing? I don't know. I mean, it's like I just feel like I like I just jump into something because, you know, Tommy and I did. And it was, we had this, you know, incredible connection. But then you jump into something and it's like, oh, it's not this incredible connection. It's this, it's something else. And then what do you do, Pam? Pam, what do you then do? I slowly when you try and find it? my way out. Do you make yourself unavailable? You don't no, want to I be think mean. I try. But I think I detach a little bit, and I think that's what's kind of made people a little crazy. And any sign of, you know, violence or kind of a disrespect or lying is my excuse to leave. Pamela and Kid Rock's divorce would be finalized on February 1st, 2007. According to Pamela, when they were separated, she ceased all communications with him and left him in the past. But at the 2007 MTV VMAs, the past would catch up when Kid Rock and Tommy Lee got into a physical altercation. Pamela writes, I was asked to present an award to Kanye West at MTV's Video Music Awards. I saw Bob on the red carpet and he looked at me and said, look what the cat dragged in. Then I saw Tommy. When I slipped past him to sit down, Tommy pulled me onto his lap. Bob saw the whole thing and was fuming. Tommy and Bob dove at each other, fists were flying, and the whole thing ended up on live TV. The reason you hit Tommy P at the MTV VMA award was because of, uh, quote, lingering level of disrespect between you and Tommy, correct? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I have been done with the MTV awards. He's at the MTV awards, whatever. He comes over and sits down. That's the smack is tied off. I punched him, um, and that was the end of it. He eventually called me after that and says, no. I understand the whole idea of what's the five months and five months. I was not a problem at all. You were wrong then? No, he said he was wrong. Did you think it was a forever thing? I thought it could be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone in like that if I didn't. And the sting of the breakup changed Richie's view of relationships. You think? Hey, touch hot stove, you get burnt, don't touch it anymore. So that was basically it? What do you What do you mean? I didn't touch the stove. I, like, put both hands on it and held them there for, like, an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so does that mean... I don't even go near the stove anymore. Does that mean you won't get married again? Oh, I, don't, I don't know what it means at all. It probably means I'm not going to be screwing around looking for love in Hollywood ever. Still searching and looking for love, Pamela married her longtime friend, Rick Salomon, in October 2007. But after finding a crack pipe in her Christmas tree... Pamela annulled their marriage in December of that year. By late 2008, she and Tommy reunited once again, but that didn't last either. In January 2014, Pamela and Rick wed for a second time, but were divorced by July. Though Pamela couldn't quite figure out her love life, she would become an incredible activist as she worked with PETA and several organizations over the course of her career. In 2014, she launched her own organization, called the Pamela Anderson Foundation, where she continued to fight for human, animal, and environmental rights. On the night of the launch, Pamela made some shocking and unexpected statements to the public during her speech. She spoke about the babysitter, the backgammon man, Boogeyman Jack, her high school boyfriend who kicked her out of his car, and Billy, the guy who assaulted Pamela with his friends. When this information came out, people were shocked. Upon Pamela's disclosure of these horrific events, one of the people she spoke about would speak out, and that person was Jack. Jack, whose real name is Tyrone, would do an interview with the Daily Mail to tell his side of the story. According to Tyrone, he and Pamela had known each other for a very long time, as they lived in the same town and grew up together. In his interview, Tyrone says that he needed to speak out out of fear that their community would assume that he was the boyfriend that attacked Pamela with his friends. He wanted to set the record straight, and let everyone know that he was not that boyfriend. He said, quote, That attack happened in 1981. Pamela and I didn't date until two years later. 
It makes me sick to my stomach that I knew nothing of it, that she hid it away. I was helping her through some tough times with her dad. He was a recovering alcoholic. It was a sensitive time for Pam. In his interview, Tyrone admits that he wasn't the best boyfriend and did not treat Pamela well, saying, Yes, we had some fights because of alcohol. We would drink together quite a bit, and we'd have blazing rows. It got physical. We did have a big fight in a car once, and I kicked the door open to get her out and threw her out of the car. But she was giving as good as she got. We were beating each other. Tyrone would go on to say that upon their graduation, he and Pamela moved in together and that when she got the offer to do Playboy, he was the man she was engaged to. According to Tyrone, he couldn't handle Pamela evolving into a woman. He couldn't handle all of the attention she was getting and gave her an ultimatum that if she did Playboy, they were done. She chose Playboy. Their relationship, however, wouldn't end there. As Tyrone showed the Daily Mail pictures she sent to him and love letters she wrote to him over the years, he claims that whenever she visited Canada, they would reconcile, even if she was in a relationship. When Pamela spoke out against the abuse she suffered, Tyrone told the Daily Mail that Pamela had a responsibility to name the person that harmed her in the car so that his name could be cleared. He said, quote, This is horrible. Everyone who knew Pam at high school is devastated. Where has this come from? We're all shocked. She has to say the truth. If she was raped, then she needs to say the names. Please tell us who did this to you. I was her boyfriend at school, and some people might point the finger at me. Surely, Pam now has a moral responsibility to tell the police who attacked her. Moving forward, Pamela would reconnect with John Peters and even announce their marriage in 2019. Two weeks later, the couple issued a statement saying that they were taking a step back from their relationship to figure out what they wanted. Pamela would later come out to say that she and John were never legally married. In 2021, Pamela married her bodyguard, Dan Hayhurst. In an interview, she praised her new husband by saying, I'm exactly where I need to be, in the arms of a man who truly loves me. On January 20th, 2022, however, A representative for the actress confirmed that the newlyweds had split and were getting a divorce. Upon this split, Pamela went right back to work, starring as Roxy in the hit Broadway play, Chicago. It would be during this performance that Pamela felt seen for the first time. Instead of being looked at as the blonde bombshell from the 90s, she was seen as a person, as a woman, and shown the respect for her work that she always craved. The actress and Baywatch babe moves confidently, carries a tune, and you know, all that jazz. Inside Edition reporter Allison Hall was there on opening night, and she loved it. Pamela Anderson was fabulous as Roxy Hart. She really embodied the role. She was charismatic. She was funny. She was entertaining. And the crowd absolutely loved her, cheering as soon as she came out on stage and giving her a huge standing ovation at the end of the show. When the play wrapped, Pamela realized that she had a lot of issues she needed to deal with. After four different marriages and unable to maintain healthy romantic relationships, Pamela discovered that maybe the problem was her. Though she had been in therapy for over 20 years, she needed to do some deep soul searching and headed back home to Ladysmith to reflect and to heal. To conquer the demons, she traveled back to where she'd first confronted them, back home. To the isolation of Ladysmith. This full circle thing was very therapeutic, and I knew I kind of had to retrace my steps as a kid. And it was very visual, and very triggering, um, and very therapeutic to be home. There was a lot of anger. During this season of healing, Pamela explains that she had so much anger and resentment built up that originated from her childhood and expanded over the years. Though it was painful to address, Pamela was ready to do the work which included sharing her story in hopes of helping and inspiring others. As she closes out her book, she writes, Men are my downfall, and I've tried all kinds. The common denominator is me. I realize I'm only at war with myself when it comes to love. Who am I when I'm alone? I'm 5'7", about 120 pounds. My eyes are a sea green, gray, and blue. They change color with my mood. Our eyes can't hide secrets. My mind is a wanderer. I'm sad a lot. A poet, but I relish the uncharted. 
searching for the feeling I can't find. I don't trust anyone. I trust everything. I want to savor these precious moments, being alone with my dogs. Nothing's impossible, it seems. Evasive only. You are not alone in this. Keep searching. There's always a mountain to climb. Love, Pamela. Life is hard for everybody. And it's been an interesting release, relief. Now I feel like the the whole story is there. So, you know, we kind of need to be kinder to each other. Maybe give each other a break sometimes. And when I look at people that are... um, you know, just even acting out or misdirected anger, I always think, what's their childhood like? Tommy and I fell in love. It felt like this really safe place. He would arrive at the house on a horse with covered, you know, in full night gear on, knight in shining armor, and read a scroll to me. It was just so hyper heightened, but it felt good. It felt like, oh my gosh, this is what it's all about. This is true love. It was so romantic. It was so over the top. But that's not a foundation for sustainable love. No, it's not a foundation for sustainable love. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I haven't figured that part out yet.